my own experiences at Church News, I'm really grateful for the privilege we have of amplifying the stories, the testimonies, the experiences of not only church leaders, but of individual members. It feels to me like the spirit of gathering. We're taking these individual stories and testimonies and faith of individual members and we're sharing them so that all might be edified together. And I consider that to be a huge privilege. I'm honored. I've also felt many times that the Lord is mindful of me. <laughs> and that's been amazing to see through the stories that I've covered. I'm Sarah Jane Weaver, editor of The Church News. Welcome to The Church News Podcast. We are taking you on a journey of connection as we discuss news and events of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For the past 13 years, Rachel Sturzer Gibson has worked for The Church News, helping to create a living record of the restoration through her writing, editing, web publication, and support. She joins this episode of the Church News Podcast to talk about her most compelling assignments, covering stories of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, her current beat writing about church education, her role as a wife and mother, and the tender years she and her siblings supported her mother as she cared for their aging father. Rachel graduated from BYU-Idaho with a degree in communications and English. Welcome, Rachel, to the Church News Podcast. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Everyone who works for the Church News has moments that they experience while creating a record of the Restoration that defines something important for them. And so as we start today, can you share some of those moments that have defined your time at Church News with our audience? There have been moments in my assignments that have showed me that the Lord is mindful of me in the grander picture. <laughs> I remember covering President Henry B. Eyring as he was dedicating the complex of new buildings and renovated buildings uh, on Temple View, which was the old church college of New Zealand. I felt the responsibility keenly to, you know, cover this event, which was really important to a lot of people throughout the Pacific and the broader church, um, but specifically the Pacific and I was super jet lagged. I hadn't been able to switch my sleep schedule over. It was all over the place. I was so tired. But the, the members there were so kind. It was after the dedication and I was in one of the buildings with my laptop and I was just trying to go through photos and do all of the things. It was a Sunday and one of the members saw me working and brought me a couple of meat pies. <laughs> They're like... You have been here for so long and you haven't eaten anything. I just wanted to make sure that you were taken care of. And it was so sweet and so generous. And I just felt so, it, it was a small thing, but I felt acknowledged <laughs> and taken care of. And I feel like that was one of the ways and one of the, one of the moments where the Lord reached out to me specifically in the broader aspect of what I was doing to let me know that I was remembered. Well, and it's true. One of the greatest blessings of working for Church News is the opportunity to associate with members of the Lord's Church in many lands. And that uh, sweet person who observed a need and then followed through, I think some of us might say, Oh, that person might be hungry, but they probably planned it. They might be they might be fasting. <laughs> they they probably have a protein bar in their backpack and, and we don't respond. But we've all felt that tender feeling when they do. When they can be the Lord's hands to bring just a moment of relief to somebody else. Yeah. Now I'm so glad that you brought up New Zealand. You also have had the opportunity to cover the dedications of some temples. Yes, I helped with the Payson Temple and the Hartford, Connecticut Temple and the Cedar City Temple. The Hartford, Connecticut Temple was 
an important one because it was my very first time covering a temple dedication solo. <laughs> and at that time, we were taking all of our own photos. And I am not a trained photographer. I was very nervous about trying to get some beautiful pictures. My philosophy was if I take enough, <laughs> hopefully there will be one usable or a few usable ones, <laughs> which I don't know how well it worked. The Lord helped me, thankfully, and we, we had a few that we could print. But I was so nervous. And one of the learnings that came from that was actually uh, advice from you. Beforehand, you sat me down and told me to focus on the next step. Don't think about the entirety of all you have to do. Just focus on the next step. And that might be, I'm at the airport. I need to go get my luggage. And then once you get your luggage, you think about, okay, I need to go get a rental car. And now I need to find the hotel. But just take it one step at a time. That was really helpful in that moment, in that situation of, oh my gosh, I have this whole weekend to cover and I need to get all these photos and different things. So that was helpful for that assignment, but it was, it's also been super helpful in situations outside of work when I've felt overwhelmed or as a new mom, <laughs> instead of thinking of, oh my gosh, how are we going to make it through this week? Or even through this day, I just think about, okay, what's the next step? Okay, I need to change this one's diaper and <laughs> you know, put this one down for a nap or whatever it might be. It's been such good life advice for me to just focus on the next step instead of being overwhelmed with looking at 20 steps down the road. I'm so glad you talked about that experience and that it had application in other places because I'm hoping you'll share with us a little bit about your journey. Uh, you married not terribly late, but a, a little <laughs> late in life. <laughs> yeah, I was 34 when I got married and 35 when I had my first baby, which I learned very quickly they call a geriatric pregnancy. <laughs> I wasn't too fond of that term. <laughs> But yeah, I had a lot of single years, which were hard in some ways and wonderful in others. We at the Church News saw sort of an evolution with you over those years. You know, there was a time when you were just happy to be out of school and enjoying the next step of life. And, and then a time when you were a little discouraged. And then there was some reluctant resolve that you were going to have to participate in finding something at a at a higher level. And so I'm not sure, but I think you, you got on the computer <laughs> and, and tried some uh, to seek out some opportunities to meet people to date. And ultimately, you found your husband. And that had to be a remarkable realization that, wow, this did come about for me. Yes, I did meet my husband through a dating app. <laughs> Uh, it has its pluses and minuses, but it, ultimately it worked. So I can't complain too much. But I think when I look back on those single years and being a single adult in the church, it was hard for a few reasons. Loneliness can be a big issue all those years being single, as well as, at least for me, a sense of stagnation was something that I struggled with. This feeling of nothing's changing. I'm not changing. Where is my life going? Here's this thing that I want, but I'm not moving toward it. And I don't want to give advice because everyone is so different. But what helped me during that time was, uh, one, I developed some wonderful friendships with other single adults who were my adventure buddies. It was so nice to have a group of people who were in the same phase of life who I could say, let's go on this trip or let's go hike this mountain or let's go do this thing. I still to this day really cherish those relationships. They still are super important to me. So that was a huge blessing was to 
develop my posse, I guess you could say, <laughs> my my group. Another thing that really helped and I, I tried to do was find opportunities to serve. And whether that was in my ward, whether that was trying to find unique ways to serve my family, sometimes it was finding ways to serve my friends. I remember one year... <laughs> I had really liked this boy and he, we'd gone on a few dates, but he had decided he wanted to date my friend. And it was Valentine's Day when he told me. <laughs> and I was feeling really sorry for myself. And so I bought some chocolates and a couple roses and made a few cards and just anonymously delivered them to a few women in my ward who I knew would appreciate them and just signed it, the Valentine's Day Fairy, and just told them, you're wonderful and beautiful and amazing, and I hope you have a wonderful Valentine's Day. And that was probably my favorite Valentine's Day ever, even now that I'm married. <laughs> but finding ways to reach out to other people and serve other people was really helpful. Another thing that I tried to do was just to have goals and things that I was working towards in all aspects of my life. And that's probably one of the reasons that I stuck with dating. <laughs> because it's hard. It's It can be awkward. There's a lot of emotional work that goes into it as you deal with rejection, as you learn how to reject other people, as you learn how or you deal with the impact of your actions are probably hurting another person. There's a lot of awkwardness and just emotional work that goes into it that can be exhausting. And I would take breaks from dating, but the reason that I kept with it was I felt like I needed to feel like I was progressing in that area of my life. That if I was doing everything I knew how to do and everything that I could, then I could have confidence that if it wasn't happening, that it was part of the plan. That I could trust in my Heavenly Father that, all right, I'm doing everything that I should be doing and if it's not happening, I can trust that this is part of my plan and of his plan for me. That brought a lot of peace. And it's why during those moments where I wanted to throw up my hands and say, I'm done with this. I don't want to put any more work into this. <laughs> I'm tired of the awkwardness and the all of the things that I kept with it despite that. So in February of 2019... You and your sweetheart are married in the, the Jordan River, Utah Temple. And that was a, a fantastic day. That marriage also included an amazing bonus because he had a daughter. And so you were not only a spouse, but you had uh, someone else in your life to care about and to love. Yeah, I have a, well, she was eight years old at the time. A stepdaughter named Anna, who is lovely. Stepping into that role was easier than I thought it was going to be in a lot of ways. I won't say it wasn't hard at times. That first year, as I was transitioning from being single for so long and autonomous and just used to making all of my own decisions on my own <laughs> to being part of a team and part of a family, there were some growing pains. But I remember my, my stake president, before I got married, um, when I was going in for our marriage interview, he came from a blended family. And so when he learned that I was going to be stepping into that role, he gave me the advice of your job is just to love her. That has been my mantra. She has a wonderful mom and a wonderful stepdad at her, uh, her other home. And so my role has just been to be one more support and one more place where she feels loved, hopefully to try and create an atmosphere in our home where she feels loved and supported. And it's wonderful. I love her and she loves me and I'm grateful for her. And one of the, the things that has always been apparent 
as we have have worked with you and gotten to know you is that you have great parents um, <laughs> who who you care deeply about. Tell us a, a little bit about your mom and dad, um, because at the same time as as you were trying to date. You were also helping to care for your father who had become ill. Yes. I do come from wonderful parents. (laughs) My dad, Lee Sturzer, was an electrical engineer. And (laughs) how do I describe my dad? He was the kind of person who color-coded his sock drawer. (laughs) My mom teases that it never had occurred to her until she married my dad that you could color code your sock drawer. He shined his shoes every day. He was a stereotypical nerd who had a pocket protector with (laughs) with his mechanical pencils and pens. Um, His idea of dressing down was to put on a polo. (laughs) He he was mostly in every day a button-up shirt. And with a tie. That was his, you know, engineer uniform. But he was also very kind for being an electrical engineer who was very, very logical and organized and straightforward. He was also extremely kind. And the term that I've heard used to describe him many times is guileless. He had no malintent in anything he did. I, re- I remember being in high school and I was I was in the band and we had just had a concert and he'd come to support me. I came to get some praise from him, you know. What do you think about the about the concert? And he was like, it was really nice. Um, you guys sounded better last time. And it, it was there was no malintent. There was no, you know, it was just very factual. Like, you know, it was great, but you you did better last time. Like <laughs> kind of let down but it also meant that when he gave praise that it meant a lot and he was very he was very effusive with affection and saying I love you I'm proud of you but he was in his later years he developed Parkinson's disease and he also developed um, the dementia that sometimes accompanies Parkinson's disease so about the last 10 years of his life, he, he lost a lot of function physically, but also mentally, which was really hard to watch him have to go through that because he'd always been such an intelligent man, very capable, very independent. And to watch him go through that process was difficult. I can totally relate to this because my father spent his last year's dealing with the effects of Alzheimer's. And he went from this vibrant, successful person to someone who could not be left alone and could not find his way home if everything depended upon it. And that was hard. It was hard in in a number of ways. It was hard emotionally to see that happen. And I found myself grieving him kind of one little piece at a time. And it was also hard physically. As a family, we had to sort of rally and figure out how to care for his needs. You're right. When you grieve them a piece at a time, every time a little piece of independence was lost, I think we would grieve for him. And he became someone who wasn't very fun to be around. (laughs) He hit the belligerent stage of his dementia, and he'd always been adoring and complimentary and supportive of my mom and suddenly he was combative and I knew that wasn't who he was but it was so painful to watch that process and I remember talking to actually Lois Collins who's been on the podcast before and is one of our dear friends whose mother had gone through Alzheimer's and that sort of process and she promised me that when all was said and done, that I'd remember him as my dad and not as that diseased person. Because in the moment when you're undergoing and seeing them, it's all you can see because it's all you can deal with. (laughs) I took comfort in that. And he's been gone. This year it will be 10 years. 
which is crazy to think about. But that proved to be true, that I don't remember as much the diseased, frail person that he became as much as I remember the vibrant and loving and kind dad that I had growing up. That was also true for me. I remember thinking when my father died and he passed away just as COVID was coming on in March of 2020. And I thought all the years that we were caring for him, that when his his time was done, I would feel relieved. And that did not happen. I just felt loss. And as time has put a little perspective with that, I too have been able to have memories of those growing up years and, and wonderful times. Now, you're in another phase of your life where you're forming some of those memories. You have two children. What is it like to be a mother? Oh, it's all the things. <laughs> it's the hardest thing I have ever done. And it's also the most joyful thing I have ever done. I have two kids. One's three and one is one. <laughs> And uh, they definitely keep me busy and keep me laughing and keep me crying. (laughs) It's hard. It's really hard. There's a sense, and maybe all moms feel this, but there's a sense a lot of, I have all these balls or responsibilities that I'm juggling and one is always getting dropped. (laughs) Or that I'm running as fast as I, as I can, but I'm still getting lapped. <laughs> and um, my daughter was born April 2020, so right when everything was shutting down. And it was kind of a scary place in the world at the time. And there was a lot of fear and anxiety going into motherhood. <laughs> I was worried about delivery. I was worried about what was going to happen after my maternity leave. I was worried about what the state of the world was like. The hospital was constantly changing. Who could come into the delivery? My mom was a maternity and nursery nurse all through her career. And I had planned on having her there and... um, A week before I delivered, I found out, you know, she wouldn't be allowed in the delivery room. And that was hard. And there was rumors going around that I might not even be able to have my husband be able to come in. And work was crazy because we were reporting on all the things that were changing, all the shutdowns. Temples were closing. We were no longer having meetings. It was it was just a crazy time all around. I wasn't sleeping because my daughter had her foot in a (laughs) in a nerve so I wasn't getting good sleep so and then we had the earthquake which just kind of was the last straw that broke the camel's back so to say I was wound tight is kind of a understatement I just remember we were studying come follow me at the time and it was Enos and I was studying about prayer and I was reminded that the purpose of prayer is to learn the will of the Lord. And I'd been kind of treating him like a vending machine (laughs) where I'm putting in my order (laughs) and not seeing what I want back. (laughs) And so I got down on my knees and for the first time, instead of just telling him everything that I wanted and everything that I was stressed about, I told him, you know, thy will be done. Let me know what it is you want in all of these circumstances and what it is you want me to do. I felt flooded with peace. It was a similar experience when I was single. I remember I I had some single friends who, after many years of being single and feeling frustrated, they felt let down by the process like it hadn't worked for them and that there was something wrong with the church or the gospel and like I had a conversation with the Lord because I was I was so heartsick about it and I just said this is what I want 
you know, I want to get married. I want to have kids. But if it's not part of my story right now, that's okay. Like, I don't want this to be a stumbling block. I don't want this to be a wedge between you and I. And it was one of those experiences, again, where it was kind of, I placed it on the altar and said, thy will be done. That brought a lot of peace at the time and continuing forward, being able to say and honestly and sincerely mean it, thy will be done, was what brought me peace then and has brought me peace as a mother and in many circumstances going forward. And I want to talk about your work now as one of your major responsibilities at Church News you have the opportunity to cover church education, and that's the church schools. Um, That beat also often includes covering the words of prophets and apostles to Latter-day Saint students who are studying on some of the church campuses. And it kind of gives you a window to see how, how education can lift and strengthen and change lives. Have you learned something specific as you've explored that beat of church education? Oh, I've learned many things. (laughs) I think one of the overarching lessons to me has been the importance of education in the gathering of Israel and in the, the work of the church, in the work of salvation of the one, and the power that it actually has to transform on an individual level as well as on a a macro level of how important it is to the work of the church overall. Well, you're going to have to detail that for us too. (laughs) A lot of institutions throughout the United States, and I'm sure globally, if they have a sister institution, they're pretty much just replications of one another. But within the church, we have very different institutions, very different tools that all perform different functions within church education. So you have Pathway, which is, you know, one that's come up most recently that is global and is able to meet students where they are, wherever they are, not only location-wise, but also wherever they are education-wise. It helps to facilitate growth wherever they are in that process, whether it's learning English, whether it's just learning basic math or whatnot, it helps them grow wherever they are and is amazing to hear the stories of how that has blessed individuals throughout the world. Then you have BYU-Idaho, which is completely undergraduate work. It's meant to teaching focused. So it offers two and four year degrees. It does not offer any graduate or graduate programs, um, which helps it keep its costs down. And also it keeps its class size down because its main focus is to be student-oriented, teaching-focused. One of the ways in which it does that is it keeps its class sizes small so that students are getting time and attention, kind of that spirit of Rick's feeling and experience when they go there. You have Enzyme College and Clark G. Gilbert, who's the Church Commissioner of Education and a General Authority 70, calls Enzyme College the Applied Curriculum Developer, (laughs) which means that students who go there are meant to see a improvement in their job immediately. It gives them job-ready skills. And like somehow the process or... They offer two-year and now some four-year degrees. And they also partner with BYU Pathway and now as well BYU-Idaho to help offer more opportunities to students. Then you have BYU-Hawaii, which offers those educational opportunities specifically to students within Oceana and the Asian Rim. And then you have BYU, which is the most seen, it's most well-known. They have sports, they have graduate programs, they do research that's internationally recognized. It's the one who's kind of leading the way in the world 
and is an ambassador for all the other church educational systems. And so each of them fills a specific role that's important within church education and fills a specific need for all the many individuals within the church. But it's all to help in that gathering that President Nelson has talked about. Education has an amazing ability to lift individuals. And I've seen how education blesses individuals, not only physically or temporally, but also spiritually. It provides self-reliance in all aspects of a person's life. And that's been amazing to see through the stories that I've covered or the individuals that I've talked to. The mission of all of them, despite their differences, is to create disciple leaders that can go out and serve in their communities, in their families, and in their homes and in the church. And we have a tradition at the Church News Podcast where we always end and ask our guests the same question and allow them an opportunity to share their testimony of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, Rachel, what do you know now after 13 years of being a reporter and editor for the Church News? I know that God loves his children and that he has given us gifts the words of apostles and prophets, the priesthood, temples, all of these things are gifts that he has given us to help us draw closer to him and to find joy in this life. In my own experiences at Church News, I'm really grateful for the privilege we have of amplifying the stories, the testimonies, the experiences of not only church leaders, but of individual members. It feels to me like the spirit of gathering. We're taking these individual stories and testimonies and faith of individual members, and we're sharing them so that all may be edified together. And I consider that to be a huge privilege. I'm honored to be able to share those and to be a participant in the process. I've also felt many times that the scripture come unto me all ye that are heavy laden and i will give you rest i come to my heavenly father with my weakness and with my mistakes and with all the things i feel like i'm doing wrong or falling short of and more times than not he just shows me that he loves me and as i turn to him continually he lets me know that I'm loved and that my efforts are accepted and that they are enough and that he can make them into something that will bless and hopefully edify other people. And that has made all the difference in my life that knowing that I can turn to him and trust him and have faith in him. You have been listening to the Church News Podcast. I'm your host, Church News Editor, Sarah Jane Weaver. I hope you have learned something today about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by peering with me through the Church News window. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast. And if you enjoyed the messages we shared today, please make sure you share the podcast with others. Thanks to our guests, to my producer, Kellyanne Halverson, and others who make this podcast possible. Join us every week for a new episode. Find us on your favorite podcasting channel or with other news and updates about the church on thechurchnews.com.